Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that this video is on our Clinton County Government Facebook Live. I am Angela Harding, Clinton County Commissioner, and we are bringing live to you a mental health speaker series. Today is our first speaker, and so please be patient uh, with us and specifically me as we work through the process. I just want to remind everyone that this opportunity was brought to us uh, through a health initiative for Rural Pennsylvania grant from the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health. And I wanna thank the committee members of uh, the coalition, the subcommittee, um, that was able to put together the speaker series and specifically Beth Whitty uh, from our planning office who was able to um, research and find this amazing organization that's gonna be bringing this series to you through Clinton County Government Grant. Uh, that grant committee consisted of Lock Haven University, uh, Department of Emergency Services, Bucktail Medical Center, Keystone Central School District, like I said, the Clinton County Planning Office, Clinton County Housing Authority, Keystone Counseling, and of course, uh, the Commissioner's Office. And so um, I'm going to read an introduction of today's speaker, and then I'm going to play a short video for you before we give the floor uh, to Ms. Malmon. And so our speaker today is Allison Malmon. Allison is the founder and executive director of Active Minds Incorporated. Allison's only brother, Brian, struggled with his mental health when they were growing up. Left with more questions than answers, Allison looked for a student organization when she arrived at college that was talking about mental health. Finding none, she started her own. Now, more than 15 years later, Allison has cultivated that small student group into the internationally recognized nonprofit organization, Active Minds. Active Minds is empowering a new generation to speak openly and to act purposefully in order to change the conversation about mental health for everyone. Allison is a graduate of University of Pennsylvania, and some of her many accolades include the USA Network Characters Unite Award, the American Express Top Global Emerging Innovator, Washingtonian of the Year, and being named a CNN Person You Should Know. Allison is the mother of three daughters and enjoys the flying trapeze. Active Mind is the nation's premier nonprofit organization supporting mental health awareness and education for young adults. Since 2009, Active Mind speakers have been providing engaging, encouraging, and safe mental health education that's tailored for students, young adults, educators, professional groups, and other audiences. Active Minds is opening up the conversation about mental health and creating lasting change in the way mental health is talked about, cared for, and valued in the United States. And before I share the video to give you more of an idea about what Active Minds is doing, I just want to let you know that Clinton County government and all of our partners um, realize that taking the first step is to have these conversations. And so we are really honored to have Active Minds as part of this discussion and bring them to our community. Um, and hopefully we can all uh, learn something and keep the discussion going. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I am going to play the video for you before uh, we hear from Allison. <laughs> Getting on a college campus for the first time can be so overwhelming because you're kind of facing the world by yourself for the first time. Growing up, I did have a lot of family members who suffered from mental health challenges. Um, it wasn't something that was always talked about. It's been very difficult to talk about what does it mean to be sad versus to be depressed? What does it mean to be stressed versus to be anxious? After losing my friend, I needed something. I was struggling a lot myself. I started Active Minds when I was a freshman in college after losing my brother, Brian, my only sibling, to suicide. Active Minds is a national nonprofit organization focused on changing the conversation about mental health. We're most well known for mobilizing young adults to get involved in and change culture around mental health. We know that life is tough for young adults. And we also know that it's not just the students who have mental illness that have issues, it's all students. We have enough research to know that all students are dealing with things like depression, anxiety, and the epidemic of loneliness. Active Minds is serving as this institution on a campus that is getting students talking, having programming during suicide prevention month, having stress relief activities during exams, screening movies, having panel discussions and keynote speakers, all with a mental health theme, so that it's not just that we're talking about mental health when there's a crisis, but we're talking about mental health every day. One of the things I love about our partnership with Active Minds is that they are creative and engaging and relatable. 
It's just in this easy language vernacular that you use on a normal. And I think that helps to decrease the stigma. It helps to start the conversation. I love that Active Mind is able to make the topic of mental health very broad, so that way all people feel included in it. We were thrilled to start working with the Rand Corporation to understand if Active Minds was really making a difference. It's a longitudinal study. It has shown that the presence of an Active Minds chapter on a campus, just that alone makes people access counseling more, feel more comfortable. Those students had lower stigma and improved attitudes around mental health simply because they felt like their campus cared. That's unparalleled in the mental health field. It's amazing the progress that this movement is making. I feel that through your work and in the generations to come, you're at a tipping point. We really see ourselves as the organization that is going to propel change in America around mental health. They're the leading organization on college campuses. All of our players come from college campuses. So now when you come into the National Football League, guess what? We're going to continue the conversation. We're going to help you to continue the conversation. So no better way to do that than with our partnership with Active Minds. When Color Street chose to partner with Active Minds, we knew that they had an amazing story to tell. Having a national reach through our network of independent sales associates and customers, Active Minds has given us the language we need to help them get the conversation going in the communities where they are. I think what Active Minds has done has been an extraordinary contribution to not only college campuses, but as a model for what we can do in civil society to make sure that we look out for each other in the same way that we hope people will look out for ourselves. The empathy, the knowledge I gained from Active Minds is something that I will carry with me long after graduating from college. Active Minds has just changed my life. It's something that I'm not sure I would be here without. It was my savior, it was my passion, and it's something that I will never forget. Active Minds is saving lives. Active Minds is a change maker. Help us as we continue to change the conversation about mental health. Great. So there's a little look at the Active Minds organization. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome Allison Malmon. And Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Commissioner Harding. Um, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here. And I want to reinforce uh, what Commissioner Harding said in the in the beginning, the, uh, the opportunity that um, this county has brought together and, and all of the players that have come together, the partners that have come together to provide this. Um, we are honored at Active Minds to be a part of um, this really revolutionary uh, set of conversations that you're starting. And um, I'm, I'm humbled to be uh, among the first and, and to have this first session. Um, truly uh, just so applaud the, the movement towards kind of creating this everyday conversation about mental health, because I just think it is so important as we want to change that culture and we want to create an environment where we recognize that mental health is part of everybody's every day. Um, it's going to be through conversations like this. So, so just so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So one moment while I get that up. Um, and slideshow. Tremendous. Okay. Um, again, uh, my name is Allison Malman. I am the founder and CEO of Active Minds. Um, more information about Active Minds can always be found here at activeminds.org on our website. Um, I want to start with a little bit of an introduction to Active Minds. You've seen the video that gives you that. Um, I'm going to spend some time today talking about who we are as an organization um, and then what, what we have found to be the really important lessons um, that we can all take forward as we talk about mental health. Some tips and some tricks that uh, as individuals that we can make um, in order to make a difference um, and just better understand what this mental health landscape looks like because we all feel it in different ways in our own homes and our own communities, uh, but to better understand how it fits into the, the wider scale of um, the world in which we're, we're operating. But to start as an introduction to me um, as executive director and, and founder of the organization, um, Active Minds is the largest national organization that is mobilizing youth and young adults to change the culture around mental health. Um, we are headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, as you heard, I, my, my roots are in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania um, and have 
quite a bit of uh, program activity as an organization in both Pennsylvania and the DC area, um, but with program sites at more than a thousand schools now in colleges, high schools, middle schools, and communities uh, in all 50 states. I am going to spend a little bit of time um, sharing with you the story of my brother Brian um, because it helps me both to under explain who we are as an organization um, and why we exist and kind of where we're headed. Um, so I, what I'd like to do is kind of share that story um, to give you a little bit more color into what I know you've, you've learned already in the video. This is a picture of me and Brian uh, when I was about 14 and he was about 18. Um, as you can see, Brian and I looked really, really similar. We always joked that we did didn't look like either one of our parents, um, but we looked very much like siblings. Um, and we were being four years apart. Um, we were kind of that typical um, brother sister pair in that we fought at the same time that we bonded the same time I asked him to drive me to 7 Eleven to get Slurpees and I would buy his Slurpee. I mean, we had a very typical um, sibling relationship. Brian um, was somebody who was extremely funny, um, was extremely brilliant, um, bright, um, knew history and knew sports, and was a brilliant singer in all the things that I was not. I was the athlete, I was the math person, I, I was all the things that he was not, which created just a really great pair for us. So we grew up outside of Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, for anybody who's familiar with the D.C. area. Um, and being four years older than me, I, I Brian was always like kind of going to a school before I entered. And I remember getting into high school and being um, Malman's little sister um, and, and always trying to live up to the name that he had set in in high school. Brian became president of the school's debate team. He was a soloist in our annual rock and roll revival show. He was in four AP classes by his senior year. Um, as I said, just like kind of nerdy, um, great friends and, and kind of that guy who just did everything and, and respected by everyone. Um, Brian got into his top choice college, which was Columbia University in New York. And so as he was going to Columbia, I was um, entering high school and living up to the, the standards that he had set for the mom and name there. Um, when he got to Columbia, Brian did what um, all young adults are told to do to make you know, the, the college kind of the best time of their lives. Um, and I'll put that in quotes because I think we often put a lot of pressure on the youth and young adults in our lives that this is the best time of their lives and, and it's never going to be as fun as this. And, and truly in reality, uh, it feels really hard for young adults in their every day. And, and um, we, we put that pressure on and in doing so, we make young, young adults who aren't having the time of their lives feel like there's something wrong with them. You know, looking back now, I will tell you that college was the best time of my life. There's no question, but that's because I'm forgetting all of the things that made it feel so hard. And um, we, we do that very regularly. And, and what that does is that actually puts undue pressure on the people who are in that moment in that time, because if they're not feeling that way, they think there's something wrong with them. They feel as though um, they are not living up to what they should be doing and um, really have that additional pressure that they that, that is more than it's needed. But Brian did all of the things. He joined an acapella group. He became, um, he joined as a writer for the, the Columbia Daily newspaper, The Spectator. Uh, wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do academically. Was really interested in political science maybe journalism. Um, in one summer, he uh, interned at a law firm and decided he did not want to go into law and so really wanted to pursue journalism. Um, gets, you know, through his time at Columbia, by his senior year, he had become sports editor of the newspaper. In addition to being a columnist, he had a 3.8 GPA. Um, he had become the, the um, the president of an acapella group and all of the things that he had joined in his freshman year had become, he'd become a leader in um, by his senior year because he was kind of a natural born leader. But in November of his senior year uh, in college, Brian went, visited the school's counseling services. Um, Columbia had a counseling center as most um, colleges and universities have. And he happened to have a Friday appointment and he went in and saw the therapist at the, the counseling center that Friday and presented with um, signs of uh, pretty severe depression and anxiety and stress. Uh, the therapist recommended that Brian come home for the weekend to relax. Um, my, we, we come from a very, very supportive family. Home is a safe space and a safe place for him. And, and between DC and New York, it's a pretty easy train ride home. And so he did, he hopped on the train and he came home um, to kind of take that step back from school, to take that step back from New York City um, and to, to get a better handle on the depression and anxiety he was feeling. 
feeling. But instead of going back to school on Monday, he stayed at home. Um, and my mom, who is a clinical social worker, was able to get him into um, talk to somebody uh, through through a, a friend and a colleague. And we're very lucky that she was able to do that because um, it was you know because of that he was able to see somebody pretty quickly. And he ended up seeing a, a clinician uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday of that week. And um, for anybody who has interfaced with the mental health system, you know it's pretty atypical to see a therapist more than once a week, once every two weeks, um, and, and certainly not typical to, to get into somebody for four days in one week. But it was because um, in those first couple of sessions, this clinician recognized that there was something pretty serious going on with Brian, far more severe than what we, would, we anticipated was kind of college stress and anxiety. Um, so Brian ended up staying in um, that, um, talking to that clinician and, and working with a number of doctors and therapists and counselors um, all through the the um, guidance of my mom and the people she was able to connect with, ended up taking a leave of absence from um, his college, um, staying home for the rest of what was his senior year of um, college and um, spending time kind of figuring out what was going on with him. It was at that point that we were able to start understanding what was going on with him as well. And what we learned the best diagnosis um, was that Brian was dealing with something called schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is a combination of Schizo, schizophrenia, um, which is experiencing psychosis, hearing voices. Sometimes um, it is auditory. Sometimes it's um, uh, uh, vision. Yeah, you know, sometimes you're experiencing um, the the auditory and or visual hallucinations. Um, for Brian, it was it was mostly voices that he had been experiencing. Um, and then the affective is depression. So schizoaffective disorder is kind of a combination of schizophrenia and depression, um, which. Uh, certainly is far more severe than um, college stress might be. And I think the thing that was the most daunting for us to understand was that Brian had been dealing with this since February of his freshman year of college. Remember, this is his senior year um, that he went to visit the school counseling services, that he takes um, a leave of absence, that he first tells anybody that he was struggling. But upon reflection, he actually remembered hearing his first voice in February of his freshman year of college. Um, but he hid it. He didn't tell anybody. He didn't understand what was going on. Um, nobody was talking about mental health. Nobody had taught him what any of this meant. And for so many of us, when we start struggling in our mind, um, he thought there was something wrong with him and it was his fault and everybody else was having the time of their lives. And since he wasn't, um, it was something that he needed to deal with on his own. And so it was through this really intensive treatment and, and th that we came to really understand the, both the severity of what he was going through, how long he had been going through it and, and how um, alone he felt and how blameworthy he felt. Um, Brian ended up staying at home for that leave of absence. I graduated from high school. I went off to the University of Pennsylvania, which is not far from DC, um, knowing that I wanted to get out of the state of Maryland, but wanted to stay close enough to home because as an 18 year old, I didn't truly understand what was going on with him. If for anybody who has experienced um, depression in yourself or a loved one, you might understand. Uh, my experience was that Brian, who was normally a very outgoing, funny, gregarious guy, um, had, had become very withdrawn and very retreated and in a way that just wasn't himself. And so, um, you know, being his kid's sister, trying to kind of be the best sister I could be, but not truly understanding what was going on. Um, so I start my um, college career at, at Penn um, and get through kind of the first, you know, semester, come home for spring break. Um, Brian is the one who drove me to the metro station so I could take a train back up to um, campus because I was um, traveling with my sports team that spring break. Uh, and I got a call back from my mom about three days after um, I had gone back to school that uh, my brother Brian had taken his own life. It was March um, of the year 2000. That was quite a, quite a while ago, but I can remember it to this day. Um, and it was, Brian was 22 years old and I was 18. And um, to become a suicide loss survivor and to become an only child um, at the age of 18 um, is, uh, an experience that I would wish on nobody. Um, and for anybody who has been through suicide loss, um, what I will share being now 23 years out um, is that I don't like the adage that time heals all wounds. That isn't something that, that resonates with me at all. But I would say that time has allowed me to learn how to live 
with Brian's loss a little bit easier um, each day. And so that is what I hope for, for you all, um, if you are more recent in your loss, that um, Brian is part of me always. And um, every moment I get a chance to talk to him, I love it. Um, and the everyday living um, gets a little bit easier with each passing week, month, year. Um, not to say that there aren't hard times and there aren't hard moments and anniversaries and birthdays aren't still very difficult, um, but the everyday feels a little bit easier each, each time um, we get through another day and another month and another year. Um, but in that moment, as you can imagine, I got that call from my mom um, and it threw me into a spiral of what is this? What is going on? Who am I now that I am an only child? What happened to Brian? Um, how could this have been? And so I dove into research and I found out that actually mental health issues are really prominent and prevalent for young adults. And the age of onset of almost every mental health issue, the age of onset of almost every mental health issue is young adulthood, is between the ages of 10 and 25. And yet nobody had taught me that. And so the fact that Brian started experiencing his mental health challenges when he was 18 was actually pretty typical. And then I learned that suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth and young adults. Second leading cause of death for youth and young adults. However, in none of my health classes and none of the um, conversations I had had about my well being as a person, had anybody ever talked to me about suicide? Had anybody ever talked to me about depression or mental health challenges or substance use? Um, and, and so there was such a difference in what I knew as a young adult versus what I needed to know as a young adult. And, and really this understanding that, gosh, what happened to Brian is pretty typical, is not that abnormal. And if it happened to him, look at how similar he and I looked. It could have happened to me. And if it could have happened to me and it happened to him, it probably was happening around me with so many of my peers and my peer siblings and my peers friends. And I didn't even know about it because we weren't talking about mental health. And so from there, I launched Active Minds as a student group first at Penn and now a national organization focused on increasing understanding and awareness around mental health, having this mental health conversation happen every day so that youth and young adults like Brian know that they're not alone, it's not their fault, and feel comfortable reaching out for help. And most importantly, that that kind of conversation happens from young adults themselves. Because even though we come from a really supportive family with a mother who is a clinician, uh, even though we had everything going for us, Brian was not going to share with with my mom, um, what was going on with him before he was gonna share with his friends. He needed to hear from friends, he needed to see from people he looked up to that they too had experienced struggles with their mental health, or they too had had to take a leave of absence, um, but then ended up coming back um, to school or, or kind of what, what they needed to do. But for Brian, he thought he was the only one on his campus struggling. He thought, there. The fact that he was not able to graduate in four years, even though he was talking about going back to school, the fact that he had gone through the, his senior year with, on a leave of absence, watching me graduate from high school, watching his college friends graduate was really, really hard for him. And he felt like a failure. When in fact, there are a number of folks who don't go straight to college or don't go to college at all, or maybe take five years off or maybe take 10 years to get through school. All of that is totally okay and totally normal. Um, and we need to normalize the fact that there's not just a clear path. And if you aren't on that clear path, that you are still doing just fine and you can still thrive. But those were messages that had never gotten across to Brian. And so in launching Active Minds as a student group, that was my goal, was to mobilize my peers to, to revolutionize how we were talking about mental health not just waiting for when there was a crisis to occur, not just waiting for when there's a suicide in our community or in our family, um, but to recognize, you know what? It's Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesdays are hard days. And I'm gonna just say, I'm gonna name it. And I'm stressed because it's a Wednesday and I have an activity going on tonight or whatever it may be. Or maybe May is mental health month, which is an extraordinary time to talk about mental health, mental health. But April, we should talk about it also. And June, it doesn't go away. And so if we make this an everyday conversation in the same way that we talk about all other health issues, then we can create an environment where people like Brian know what they're going through as soon as they are, and most importantly, feel comfortable reaching out as soon as they need it. And friends feel comfortable and understand how to reach out to each other. 
Active Minds is now in our 20th anniversary year, which I'm so proud to say. And we have grown, as I said earlier, to more than a thousand schools, many of whom that have that same chapter model as that first school at Penn uh, 20 years ago. Many schools and communities have brought in some of our programs, our speakers, our trainings um, to talk about how can we change policies at schools and in communities to be more supportive of mental health and, and particularly the mental health of that needs identified by youth and young adults themselves. Um, what are the suicide, there's a suicide prevention exhibit that we travel called Send Silence Packing that represents um, the prevalence and the importance of suicide prevention in this work, um, as well as trainings and tips and tools for parents and teachers and high school students and middle school students to organize to have their own level of support um, when we talk about mental health every day. What I want to start with a little bit in, in, as we do this work is just looking at the numbers. As I mentioned at the beginning, we all have our own personal experiences and we all come to this with, with different frames. But I think it's really important to start with recognizing these issues um, are real. And I want to name that mental health issues have been real for a very long time, um, long before the pandemic. But the pandemic um, did nothing but exacerbate them. And so when we look at these numbers, it's six, more than 60 million people experience mental illness each year in the US and 30% of young people have a diagnosable mental illness. That is true of today and it was true before the pandemic as well. Um, what the pandemic has done is, is highlighted the, the need for us to not ignore this anymore. Um, the need for us to talk openly about mental health and create the opportunities for people to get the help that they need as soon as they need it. Um, we also have to recognize the isolation and the social skills that were, were taken from youth and young adults, especially during COVID, during times when young adults are supposed to be, um, you know, uh, rebelling against their parents and spending their all their time out with their friends when they were forced in their homes to stay there. That was a that's a really, really hard time to be able to build back those social skills and, and the, the, the ability to connect. Um, and so the pandemic has shown great impact on youth and young adults themselves, um, and especially, um, but it was not just limited to the pandemic. Um, we know that uh, there's a two two times increase in the number of college students with one or more mental health problems from the years 2013 to 2021, that 48% of young adults, 18 to 25, experienced mental health symptoms during the pandemic. 48%, that's half of young adults experienced symptoms of mental health challenges during the pandemic. 33% increase in the proportion of adolescents experiencing anxiety or depression from 2016 to 2020. And the recognition that across every racial and ethnic group in high school, there was an increased percentage of students who felt persistently sad or hopeless. On the flip, if you looked at the left-hand column, there are a couple of statistics that are especially important to us as we look at our work at Active Minds. One is that 67% of college students, a full two-thirds of college students who feel suicidal, tell a friend before telling anybody else. And this is reflective of what I knew in Brian's story and, and, and his experiences um, that, and many of us can look at our own children or the youth and young adults we work with or within our peers, if you're a young adult yourself, peer, young adults are talking to their peers first, especially um, when they are in struggle. And so when we talk about mental health, and opening up a conversation and we talk about suicide prevention, we cannot ignore the role that that peer to peer connection plays, not necessarily seeing peers as uh, counselors, as clinicians, as professional, um, but you don't need to be a professional to be of support. Um, we, if, if young adults are talking to each other about mental health, we need to equip the youth and young adults in our lives with the language to use, the tools to use, to be able to talk to their friends who are coming to them and, and sharing. And then this last bullet is one that um, I, I per particularly um, hone in on when I do this work and I think about our work, is that we know that young adults hold some of the least stigmatizing attitudes towards mental illness and are more likely to know someone with mental illness, but they are less likely to feel that they know how to help. So stigma rates are going down. Fortunately, we are in a space where we are talking about these issues more. We have a far way to go, but we're not yet giving the youth and young adults in our lives the words to use or the models to follow in order to help themselves and help their peers, which is a great opportunity for all of us 
to open up conversations in our homes, in our schools, uh, in our workplaces, so that we can all be equipped with the tools and information that we need. There are a few areas that we have really focused in on at Active Minds that I think are really important. Um, as you look at as an individual, what can I do and what are immediate changes I can make? Number one, um, we say just be there. You don't need to be an expert to help. You just need to be there. There is a, a, a big fear in mental health that if you're going to say something wrong, um, you're going to that if you say something, you're going to say something wrong. And in fact, what most people need is just a support. And so when you're afraid to talk to somebody, you see that they're not doing well, but you don't know what to say. Just be there. Just be a support for them. So many times that's all we need. And think back in your own life when you just wish somebody would sit there and say, I see you, I'm here with you. And I challenge you, next time somebody says, how are you doing? Answer that question. I want you to answer seriously and say, you know what? Today's a pretty hard day or I'm doing great. I'm really feeling good today. Because what you will do in actually answering that question is that you will open up the opportunity to the person who asked you to be like, oh, we're gonna really go there. Then I can tell you how I'm actually doing. And it's small changes in conversation like that that can open up the chance for, for those of us who need to share but don't really know how to, to do it. And so it's a way both to share what's on your heart and what's going on in your life and to open and to welcome that from the person that you're asking from. A few years ago at Active Minds, in partnership with students, um, we developed a program called VAR, Validate, Appreciate, Refer. And the idea behind VAR is these uh, young adults came to us and said, you know what, we are tabling on our campus where we're advertising Active Minds and getting people to join our, our organization and attend our events. And we're having a number of students come up to us saying, I, I have a friend who's struggling, but I don't know what to say to them. How, how can I help them? And so the concept of VAR was born in this idea that we're not all clinicians and we're not supposed to be, but there are certain things that we can all do in conversation with each other to support each other. We, we like to call VAR everyday conversations for everyday struggles. V is validate. When somebody comes to you and says, I'm not doing okay, validate. I hear you. That sounds really hard. That's not a time to say, well, at least you don't have this going on, which I do, or what do you have to complain about? Or what do you have to worry about? You have all this going for you because this is not a comparison game. This is about whatever we are each feeling, knowing that 40, nearly 50% of youth and young adults experience mental health, like symptoms of a mental health challenge in, during COVID, everybody is struggling. So validate that struggle as real. I see you, I hear you, that must be really hard. A appreciate. Thanks for sharing that with me. Um, that, that must have been really hard to share. And I really appreciate you opening it up to me. Doing that really welcomes that person in to say, okay, this is a safe and trusted person. And this person sees how hard this is for me to be, to be open about how I'm feeling. And then R is refer to skills or support. This is the time where you can say, hey, um, do you want to go out for a walk? Would that make you feel good? Or um, maybe this, this kind of concerns me. Can we bring in um, our parent or can I walk you over to the counseling center or should we call a suicide prevention lifeline in this moment? Those, that ref, ref, referral could be any which way, everything from that walk to screaming into pillows to um, really calling 988 and calling the suicide prevention lifeline. But this idea that we as individuals don't have to be the problem solver, but we can help connect the person in our lives who is struggling with the solution that will help. And if you don't know what to suggest, you can just say, what would be helpful to you right now? Oftentimes people can identify for themselves, not always, um, but it is a great place to start if you don't have a natural go-to place. So VAR, and to be very honest, I use the VAR all the time with my husband, with my children, um, when they're coming to complain to me about anything, it's okay, validate how they're feeling. They're, what they're feeling is how they're feeling, even if it's not how I would say I'm feeling or I don't quite understand it. You don't have to understand it, but you can validate, you can appreciate it, right? Validate it, appreciate their sharing, and then figure out how to problem solve. Um, it's an incredible tool that helps 
um, it, it, at all levels of struggle, um, whether it's my child who's frustrated she didn't get dessert, um, or it's somebody who is really starting to experience um, some pretty low points of their life and just needs somebody to talk to. Um, bring in that trusted referral source as soon as is needed, for sure. Um, but we don't need to wait until it's a crisis before we reach out to a counselor or before we reach out to each other to share how we're doing. Another really important part of what we have learned over these past 20 years is just how critical the voices of youth and young adults are in mental health. I saw 20 years ago how differently my friends and my brother's friends responded to his death versus how my parents' and grandparents' friends and generation did. And none of it was vindictive. Everybody did their absolute best. But I was in a generation 20 years ago that said, we don't know what to say but we really wanna be here to support. How can we help? And at the same time, um, people from, from my parents and grandparents' generations also didn't know what to say and they shied away because they were afraid of saying the wrong thing. Youth and young adults know what they're struggling with, really have an idea of how it's gonna, how it could be better and how it can be improved um, and so desire to be part of this work. So if you are in a school talking about how to address mental health of your students, bring some student leaders into that conversation. If you are uh, in a workplace, um, bring some of your younger employees into that conversation of how it can be addressed here in this workplace. And certainly if you're a parent, don't be afraid to and actually actively seek out the, the thoughts of the kids in your life because even if we don't talk about it, they're feeling it. And so it's not as though by not talking about it, we're preventing it from being there. No, it's there. It is there in their lives. And if you welcome in their voices, it's gonna be a really important way to, um, to learn how we can bring these conversations up and give everybody the support they need. Finally, language. This is a change that we can all make starting today. Uh, we use language in mental health that uh, it, you need to stop. So for instance, I will start by asking the question, did Brian, my brother Brian commit suicide? Technically he did, but he did not commit burglary or perjury or another crime. Suicide is the only method of death that we use the word commit. If you think about that, we are automatically um, belittling and um, demonizing suicide, which is a result of, of mental health struggles and mental illness and depression and all sorts of things that come into play um, with substance use and mental health. But we are, we are calling suicide a bad thing um, in, in a way that we don't say that somebody committed a heart attack or committed cancer. We would never imagine that. Suicide is the tragic result sometimes of mental health challenges that we can address and we can talk about and we can work to support each other through. Additionally, was Brian schizophrenic? Was he depressed? Technically, but actually he was a brother, a friend, a son who had schizoaffective disorder. We have to stop labeling ourselves and the people in our lives and the people we look at as their diagnoses. Because when, they, when we do, we, we take away their agency of who they are as individuals. My friend from high school wasn't anorexic because that defines her entirely. No, she was somebody who had struggled with anorexia. My brother, Brian, is somebody who has lived with or who dealt with schizoaffective disorder. Again, think about the other health causes and, and, and causes of struggle for so many people. And we don't ever identify somebody by their illness in the same way that we do with mental illness. We need to remove these labels to recognize that we all uh, struggle in different ways with different things. And whether or not we've been diagnosed with a substance use disorder or with bipolar disorder or with post-traumatic stress, we are still individuals who are living and dealing with those, those um, challenges or those struggles or those parts of our identity every day. Was Brian mentally ill? Technically, but it's not as though he was mentally ill and I'm mentally not ill. Like, what does that even mean, right? Men we may not all have mental illness, but we all have mental health. And our mental health is a part of our everyday. And our mental health goes up and down every day. And so for some of us, 
Um, our mental health means that we are taking walks and going on runs and screaming into pillows and journaling to take care of our well being. For some of us, we're on medication to take care of our mental health and well being. Some of us are in inpatient treatment to take care of our mental health and well being. And it all exists on a spectrum. And for some of us who are here now, we're going to be here later, or we're here now, or we're going to be here later. Um, this spectrum of wellness is, is real it, with our bodies, just like with our minds. And so if we can remove the us versus them, oh, that person is over here and I'm over here, we can recognize that though people in our lives, in our families, in our, in our classrooms, in our communities who are struggling are just people who are in a, a tough spot with their mental health right now, and they, they need and they deserve the support that they can get in this moment so that they can continue to thrive. Was Brian crazy? Was he nuts? Was he insane? Uh, I'm not even going to answer the question um, because it. every time I use those words, it hurts me deeply because I know that every time that Brian heard those words, it cut him to his core. We, we throw those words out all the time um, in our typical vernacular, but actually each one of those is derogatory towards somebody with a mental illness. So technically, Brian was all of those things. But especially in that time when people didn't know he was struggling with his mental health and he would be in a group of friends or um, be surrounded by people when somebody would say, oh, that person is crazy. Brian felt that to his core because he knew that he was actually crazy and they were using that word in a derogatory way. And so if we can remove those words, you know, the weather isn't bipolar. You can say the weather is ridiculous or I had a wild day. We don't need to say the word crazy. We don't need to say the word insane and we don't need to use mental health diagnoses as uh, adjectives in our everyday language in a way that we wouldn't use for anything else. We can pick those different words and that's a change that you can start making right away. Beyond that, beyond the conversation change, what, what I encourage you to do is talk, is to open up your, your idea of what you're comfortable speaking about and to whom. Because if we talk about mental health being on a spectrum, we need to recognize that by opening up a conversation to that 10-year-old who is feeling a little bit anxious or to that 20-year-old who is first starting to experience um, body image issues or to that 30-year-old who has been drinking more than he or she should, but nobody's really talking to them about it. The moment you can open up and be real in the moment right now, we can, we are doing upstream prevention. We do not have to wait until there is a severe mental illness. We do not have to wait until there's a suicidal gesture or a loss by suicide. We can talk about these things right now so that folks know, gosh, when I'm not really doing okay, that person is somebody I can talk to and I can trust and they're gonna love me or they're gonna support me unconditionally and I don't have to be afraid. Because we are so quiet, because this is such a topic that we feel so ashamed about, what happens is that we are not creating that environment where people feel comfortable sharing their every day until for so many people, it is too late. I want to close um, with just a couple of more slides um, to talk you through a little bit more of the programming that we do at Active Minds, just to get your juices flowing about what you can do in your school, at, in your community, in your home, um, whether it's Active Minds or not, but just examples of some of these conversation changes that you can make. So this top left picture is a, it's a picture of our program called Send Silence Packing. Send Silence Packing is a, an exhibit of backpacks that represent the young adults who die by suicide each and every year. And as if you can, you can see in this picture, it is hundreds of backpacks that take up the size of almost a third of a football field. And if you demonstrate the, the enormity of what suicide loss can mean, we can start opening up that conversation of what suicide prevention can mean, what this, this mental health conversation can do towards preventing suicide. And I wanna be clear that not every suicide can be prevented, just like not every heart attack can be prevented, but we can do things to help prevent suicides. We can open up mental health conversation to help prevent suicides. I believe so strongly that if Brian had gotten help for his mental health earlier than he did, his life would have been different and that he might still be here today. And it wasn't just about the moment that he ended up taking his life. 
it was about the four years before that, that we could have, society could have been better and different to him so that he could have felt comfortable getting the help that he needed as soon as he needed it. Um, and that could have changed the course of his life. On the bottom left is a picture uh, of our, our speaker, Pablo, um, speaking to a group of high school students. We have a speakers bureau at Active Minds, uh, which you're gonna be able to hear quite a number of us um, over the course of the next few months, sharing personal stories, um, but more importantly, bringing those personal stories back to you. Our speakers will travel to high schools, to um, colleges, community colleges, communities to share their personal stories, but talk about the role that everybody can play in their own well-being as well as the well-being of the people around them. Um, so you can think about how you react to friends and your own children and um, your parents and your colleagues and the people that you manage um, along the same lines of youth kind of thinking about how it, how it interplays in their own life and how what these stories mean um, really reflects their own life and to know that they're not alone. On the bottom right is a picture of a student ID card and what's noticeable about this is um, on that it's a small number kind of the right underneath the university safety information number three says national suicide hotline um, at the time the the national suicide hotline number was 1-800-273-8255 which was 273 talk um, just this past summer we as a country have moved over to using 988 as our suicide prevention hotline which is super easy to remember but what's meaningful about this is that there's a chap a group of students who at their school lobby to get the suicide prevention hotline number printed on the back of student ID cards. Every student had to walk around with a student ID card and by getting this number printed on the back of student ID cards, students turn that card over and they say, you know what, my school cares about my mental health at the same level that they care about my safety, um, walking home at night, uh, and, and all of the other pieces that are on this ID. Gosh, my community cares. And Data and anecdotes will show you both, will tell you both that knowing that a, their community cares is revolutionary for a youth, a young adult, especially who, who are struggling with their mental health. When they believe their campus cares about their mental health, they are vastly more likely to reach out for help, to reach out for help through the counseling center. Um, if they believe that their family cares, they are much more likely to reach out to their family to let them know they're struggling. So a simple way um, that um, can make such a big difference is by doing something like this, by getting putting the hotline number printed on student ID cards or on top of syllabi or on your school's website where your students are to let them know, you know what, your mental health is as important to us as your academics, as your safety, uh, as all of the other things that we have already told you is really important to us. In the top right is a, uh, an image of a guide that we created in Active Minds um, called Creating a Culture of Caring for a faculty resource that we created in partnership with um, the, the AAQ, um, the Association of College and University Administrators, I think is the, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that one wrong. Um, but what we did in partnership with them is we recognized that if we're gonna be looking at youth and young adult mental health, all of us as adults in the world, we need more understanding of our own mental health as well, uh, both for our own well-being as well as to be able to help the youth and young adults in our lives. So I, I issue that as a challenge to you. If you are an adult watching this and you haven't necessarily tapped into um, your own struggles or don't really understand, uh, or haven't really learned how to take care of it for yourself, I encourage you to do that because it's really, really hard, actually impossible to be an advocate for the child or the young adult in your life if you don't have that sense of, of well-being yourself. And we don't prioritize that. It has not been something that we have been raised to prioritize, that our workplaces are necessarily responsible for prioritizing. And so maybe it is kind of understanding your drinking or maybe it is understanding the body dysmorphia or body image issues you've had or the depression you experience or the anxiety you experience, whatever it is, do what you need to take care of yourself, 
create the structure around you to take care of yourself and to better your own well-being and mental health in order to then be able to help the youth in your lives. And, you know, for, for everybody who has been on an airplane and you know that that common saying of um, put on your own oxygen mask before you help somebody else, um, it, is, it is so true in mental health as well. Um, we cannot be a good support and a good advocate for others unless we're doing that for ourselves. Um, and I include in that caregivers. Um, when, when I was, um, you know, when Brian was alive and struggling with his mental health, I never felt like my challenges were as severe as his. Who am I to talk about the, the pain that I was feeling having a, an older brother who was a very different person now or not understanding what it was like to be um, a younger sister of somebody who had a mental illness and I didn't even know what that meant. But Brian was the one who was really struggling and I never felt like I deserved that. Well, you know what I did? And caregivers do. And it's really, really important to recognize how hard a role that is and an important one. And so you have every right to be taking, to be in therapy or talking to a partner or spouse or a parent, whatever it may be, um, in addition to the support that you're providing to the friend or family member in your life. I will end with two more slides. One is just a resource slide so that everybody is able to tap into the resources that are available to you. On our website, activeminds.org slash get help, you can find all sorts of links to different resources. Um, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as I mentioned before, is just 988. You can dial that from any phone, just like you would 911, and you would get routed to a crisis center near you um, who can help walk you through. I think it's important to know that 988 is available both for somebody who themselves is thinking about suicide or somebody who is worried about a, a friend or a family member. You don't have to be yourself in crisis. If you're trying to find it, figure out what to do to help somebody, you can always call 988 as well. Um, additionally, there's a resource called the Crisis Text Line. If you text the word BRAVE to 741741, you can access crisis counselors um, via text. And that's especially important if you're in an environment where you don't really feel comfortable speaking, um, you know, talking about what's going on. Maybe you share a dorm room with, uh, with a roommate, or maybe you are uh, in a family situation where speaking what your struggles are doesn't feel comfortable to you. Texting is a phenomenal way to do it. Additionally, um, in partnership, uh, we together are providing the Project Wake Up to your community. And so there is a link, um, vimeo.com slash 410-372-342 um, to be able to access Project Wake Up, which is an incredible film um, to, to learn more about mental health and kind of just use as a tool and a resource in your school, in your community. Um, the password is Active Minds 2021. Um, and there's a number of uh, remote resources available to encourage you also, if you feel up for it, we would love to hear your feedback on today's presentation and really the presentations that you'll hear throughout the course of the next few months, um, providing that helps us to be able to um, really create the, the resources that are most important to you and what most needed to you. Um, and then I will finally end with this. If nothing else, I hope that you um, can see the importance of changing the culture around mental health. And we need to change this culture for everyone to get the help that they need and that they deserve. Um, I think it's really important to note that we are under-resourced in our counselors and we need to bring in more therapists to the field. Um, but I believe very strongly that we could quadruple the number of therapists out in the world, but we still don't live in a society where it's okay to say, I need help. And that's the role that we can all play so that we can get the people they help they need as soon as they need it. Um, thank you again so much for including me, including Active Minds, um, for taking this really, really important step for your community um, and taking that really important step for your, for your friends and family right, right away. Give me one second here. Allison, thank you so much. That was incredible. And we greatly appreciate uh, your time and your message. And um, we really look forward to being able to give our community uh, more of your team's message. Um, and just to remind anyone who was able to tune in on this live today, um, our next Active Mind speaker will be May 10th, and that will be Abraham Scully. And his uh, focus uh, and his topic will be about around depression. And so uh, just to reiterate to anyone who's tuned in today, 
Um, this opportunity um, was brought to you through a grant to Clinton County government from the Health Initiative for Rural PA. And I want to again acknowledge our partners at Lock Haven University, Keystone Central Department of Emergency Services, the Clinton County Planning Office, Keystone Counseling, Bucktail Medical Center, because all of those folks who were involved in that subcommittee um, were able to work hard to get us the monies to be able to bring attention to mental health to Clinton County. Um, we care about you and we want to change uh, the way that we talk about mental health here in Clinton County and we want to make sure that um, you know that we care. So thank you so much for watching today. Um, this video will stay up on our social media uh, for a few days and then we will transition it to our website. So hopefully um, you can share it, um, encourage your friends and family to watch it. Um, and again, we have several months lined up. We're gonna be covering veterans and first responders, depression, suicide, men and mental health, youth mental health. We've tried to select topics that we think are relevant to Clinton County. So Allison, thank you again so much. And uh, we'll look forward to meeting the rest of your team as uh, our speaker series develops.